Hey, good morning, church. How you doing? My name is Keith. I'm one of the pastors here for Bridgepoint, and it's so good to be with you this morning. I want to welcome those who are watching online and you who are in the room. I would love for you to turn to your neighbors, give them a smile or wave, let them know you're happy they're here. All right. Before we dig into God's word, let's take a moment and ask for his blessing and uh, quiet our hearts before. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity, the privilege and honor it is to gather as your people, to sing from the mountaintops about what you've done in our lives. Thank you for rescuing us. God, thank you that you do not leave us alone, that you let us come close to you. We can have fellowship with you and communion with you. God, I pray now that you would speak through your word, that people would hear the word that you have for them today. God, do the work in our hearts, clear our minds, and go to work. In Jesus' name, amen. I love when people get together to do something silly or special. Um, a couple months ago, I went to the Red Sox game, and because they are terrible, uh, by the second inning, they were down 8 nothing, and everyone's doing the wave already. So we're going to try it, okay? We're going to test our unity right now. We're going to practice the wave you're going to go first in this section. You're going second. You're going third on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three, go. We just did it. We just did the wave. Our unity is amazing. Oh, man. But there's something special about working together to accomplish a mission or a goal. It could be something silly like doing the wave at a Red Sox game or singing Sweet Caroline in the seventh inning of the Red Sox game. But more importantly, when, when you go to something like a natural disaster and people come across um, the world and the country to help each other, to comfort and support, we see unity. In your family, when something difficult happens, maybe when tragedy hits, people come together because they want to be with you. They want to comfort you and support you. See, unity does something to the human soul. It connects us. It provides the hope that we need to work together, to overcome challenges, to achieve great things. They teach us the importance of teamwork and just being there for one another with emp empathy and support. Stories of unity are crucial for us and the well-being of society at whole, and they remind us of what we can do when we put our differences aside and we come together as one people. And so we've been in this series called Uncommon Unity. Th that's what Jesus wants for his people, that the unity we have together as a church family is confounding to the world. It doesn't make any sense to them. But God needs to do the work in us and through us so we can display that to the world. See, unity is addressed in nearly every New Testament letter from Paul and many other writers of the New Testament because they struggled with it. It wasn't because they were killing it. That's why he writes to them often to say, guys, pursue unity. Jesus prayed that every generation of Christians would be unified because they have a common mission. And we know, we've talked about the threats to our unity for weeks. And if you've missed any of those, those messages, you can go online. And I want to encourage you to listen to them because I really think this series is important for us to maintain our unity. Because, listen, if we, we're going to be the people of God we're going to go out into the, to the world and for people to see God through us, we've got to show them something that's attractive. And that is a people that love one another like Jesus loved us. And so today we're going to take a look uh, at what unity looks like. Like how do you actually do it, you know, uh, practically, day to day? It, it can't be just something that is just words, platitudes and statements, right? It's got to be something that we actually do together, that we live it out. There's, there's something sweet in the action of actually living out unity together. In John chapter 17, as Jesus was uh, making his way to the cross, um, he says this to his disciples. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning like it's not for the disciples of just that time. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and I. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you in me and I am you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
And so unity is important to God because it reflects him, reflects God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, working together in common love and unity. And Jesus prayed back then that you and I would be one. We would be one in heart, one in spirit, moving forward in cooperation with one another to make much of Jesus. And it sounds really simple, right? Like unity on the, on the front. It's like, yeah, we can, we can do that. It's, it's not that hard. It looks beautiful when you see it. Like we just did the wave and you're like, yeah, that's cool. Or like when people come together, yeah, that's, that's awesome. But why is it so difficult to achieve? Why is unity so hard? It seems elusive. Like you can't even hold on to it with your hand. When you look to the world, you don't really get much support when it comes to unity, right? The reality is in the church, it's the same. The difference is, is that we, we follow Jesus. We love him. We have his support. We have his spirit. And that is the fuel that we need. We are a diverse people. Like we come from different cultures and different experiences. And so sometimes we don't always agree on everything. But the reality is God gave us what we need. And in, he wants us to do the hard work at figuring out what it means to be unified so we can make much of Jesus together as a church. So I know that it's hard to achieve. I think that it's supposed to be that way. If you read the scripture, you won't find passages that, that talk about how easy this is. In fact, it's telling you real stories. The Bible's not sanitized. It tells you the, the bad, the difficult, the ugly, so that we can learn from it, to realize that we're kind of just like them, but we need a little bit of a kick, right? So we can move forward to try to pursue that as a church family. And so that should tip us off that it's going to be difficult. Pursuing unity should be difficult. It's where we get to meet God in that place as he works through us and in us. I feel like that it's it's way that God designed unity to happen. Like he put people and said, hey, listen, love me and let's figure this love thing out together. He wants us to depend on him, to follow him, to love one another like he loved the church. And then something beautiful really happens. First thing I wanna share with you today is pursuing unity will refine us. As you and I pursue this lofty goal of pursuing unity, it's going to refine you personally, and it's going to refine us collectively as the church of God. See, when you think about um, unity, think about a beautiful gemstone, right? A beautiful gemstone is a dull rock. That's all it is. But with friction and pressure, it grinds off those outer layers, and the beauty of the color comes to the surface, then it develops this beautiful sparkle and polish, but it all happens only because of friction and pressure. Doesn't that sound interesting? The way that we are going to grow in our unity is through friction and pressure and difficulties. That's how we grow. That's how we grow in any part of life. So think of it like uh, the gemstone, that uh, as we start to lock arms with one another and do life with one another, man, the beauty of God will emerge at one time. And so even, even though it's difficult to pursue unity, we know that it will refine us. It's going to challenge us to look beyond our own personal preferences, our own bias, our own personal interests. It is going to require that the people of God are humble, that they're, they're empathetic, they're willing to show and, uh, kindness and listen to different perspectives. It's actually how we grow. And then you're forced to, to conf confront your own issues your own shortcomings, your own prejudices and biases. That's what this process does. But ultimately, when we pursue unity together, it will deepen our spiritual connection to God in one another. It'll mature us deeply. It'll shape us to look like a community that others on the outside look and say, what is it about those people? And it draws them closer to Jesus. That, that is our goal. See, in the last few months, I learned a lot about unity um, through pain. You know, uh, a friend of mine, um, we kind of grew apart. Uh, he and I grew apart. And we can't figure out why, or at least we couldn't until that point. Like people that you love, it kind of stinks when your relationship goes south. But then you've got to do the work to sit down with that person and say like, what's the deal? You know, like you love me, I love you. We both love Jesus. So how can we figure out what's happening in the middle? And it's only in conversation with that person you start to seek understanding, right? You say, oh man, I, I know where I went off here. Man, like I, I start to share some things about me and, and how I felt and the same thing's happening back and forth. Do you know what's happening in that process? Friction, pressure, understanding, empathy, love, compassion. 
And because we love Jesus, he is the first thing on our mind. Man, we're growing in unity together. And this spills everywhere else in our lives. That's the point, is that going through this process will refine you personally and collectively as a church. The second thing it's going to do is our unity will make the love of Jesus visible on earth. Jesus says this in John 13. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Again, sounds super simple. But he says the way the world is actually going to to know who I am is the way you love one another. It's not going to be through um, some of the things that we think. Like they, they, they might come here and know the love of Jesus through the preaching of the word and through music and all that. But the world out there who often will not come and be a part of God's people, they're going to see it in you and they're going to be attracted to that. So as Jesus is going to the grave, he says, hey, love one another as I loved you. That's how you prove to the world how much that I love them. It's going to come from you. See, we live in a, in a world today, I don't think it's new from the past. I just think the news media makes it worse. But everything is about division and divisiveness and disunity. I don't think it's new. It's always been around. And if you're not on the right side of the conversation, you get pushed to the side. But I want to remind you something right now. Because we see it happening in our fr- uh, friend circle. We see it happening at home. We see it happening sometimes in the church. But do you know what we have already gone through as a church family? Let me remind you. 2016 ridiculous uh, election cycle. You can talk about that in church. It's okay. 2016, ridiculous, right? 2020, terrible. We went through the COVID-19 pandemic. We're in 2024. That's why we're talking about unity. But the reality is, is that we have already walked through so much turmoil and so much pain. Our church is not perfect, but do you see where we are already? Like, look around you. Everyone that, to your right and left, they don't look like you. We're different. We have different qualities. We come from different places and we have made it through the worst times in society still loving each other, loving God and loving each other. Isn't that incredible? And so when you love one another, you make the the love of Jesus tangible, something that people can actually hold on to. And they go, I want that because I'm not getting it anywhere else. So when we love one another genuinely, the world takes notice. They may not tell you that right away. But I can tell you, person after person that I talk to who do not follow Jesus, they're always, their their number one question is always, why do you guys love each other so much? Why are you so kind? Uh, Depends when you get me, but seriously, why, why, why are we so kind, right? Our unity points to this transforming God. And that kind of love is attractive. As an unchurched guy, on the outside looking in, just watching the people of God and how they interact with one another, that's the thing that drew me close. That's the thing that drew me close to you. And I've seen it. I've experienced it my whole time that I've been here at Bridgepoint. There's something incredible in this place. And I think it always starts with the spirit of Jesus. But he has made you like that. And when we choose unity over personal preferences, we make the love of Jesus visible. It's so attractive. I'm telling you, if you would just choose it for yourself each and every day, choose unity. So the question is, how do we practically grow in our unity, right? So it's like we've heard a lot over the last several weeks. Go back and listen to them because you're going to need to often. Colossians chapter 3 provides a, a beautiful understanding, I think, of what it could look like for us to be unified as the people of God. Um, so I want you to turn there. Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. If you don't have a Bible at home, you can take that home with you because we want you to have the Word of God in your house. But Colossians was written by a man named Paul, and he writes to the church in Colossae, uh, which is in modern-day Turkey. And again, he's writing this letter to them, not because they're killing it when it comes to unity. But I want to remind you, before Paul was a writer of Scripture, he was a persecutor of Jesus. He persecuted the people of God. And one day, on his way to Damascus, you can read it in in Acts chapter 9, Paul meets Jesus on the road. And Jesus knocks him off his high horse, so to speak. Paul was never the same. And he wrote most of the New Testament letters. So think about a guy who was trying to scatter Christians, writing a story, a letter to Christians about being one, about being united in Christ. It doesn't even make sense to my mind. But Paul is reminding them 
in this, um, in Colossae, of what God has already done in their lives. So sometimes before we get to the truth, we got to work through difficult things, right? Colossians chapter 1, it says this, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your minds on, on things above, not earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul reminds them that their old life is gone. Like it is a side. It, it's put to death that their life is hidden with God. And that when Jesus comes back, we will be with him in glory. But he's also reminding them of something really special and something important. I want you to, he's saying, set your mind on things above. So in your day-to-day, whatever's going on around you, Remind yourself to have a heavenly perspective that you would look to the things of God as you try to assess what is happening around you in the world. He's saying, set your mind, set your hearts on me. That's the first way that we pursue unity. We set our hearts and minds on Jesus because he gives us what we need to pursue this kind of unity. Continues in verse five as Paul is saying, hey, you're made alive in Christ, but then he's gonna tell you there's still some things that you've got to to work on. He uses strong language. In verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. He says, You used to walk in these ways in the way that you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self and its practices. Remember, take off, and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Christ is all and is all. And so Paul uses this strong language to to say, hey, there's some things in your life that you've got to continue to put to death. Some are very obvious on the surface. Some need some work. They happen in quiet places. Paul's saying, hey, put to death those things that Christ freed you from. Live in the new realities of Jesus. See, it's like taking off an old garment. Maybe you're a runner and you, you, know, you, you run and you start, you're sweating all that stuff. You get home, you're like, oh man, you take that off. You don't put it back on. You do not put that back on. <laughs> Things are not gonna go well with you. And so he's saying, put on the new self. Embrace this new way of life that verse in verse 11, when he talks about the different people, he says, you're different people. Uh, you look different, you act different, you come from different cultures, but you are one. You are one under me. And so the way to pursue unity is to kill some of these things in your life, to put them to death. That's why Jesus went to the cross, right? So in light of that, verse 12 says, therefore, so everything that you just read, therefore, as God's chosen people, you are holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Man, we have been chosen by God. Think about that for a minute. That is hard to explain, describe, or even receive, but you have been chosen by God. You are dearly loved by the God of the universe. And you are called to clothe yourself in the qualities that match the character and life of Jesus to put on a compassionate hearts that have empathy and concern for others, being kind, treating each other with the dignity and respect that they deserve because everyone that you lock eyes with is made in the image of God. They deserve those qualities, especially in the church because we love one another. We're called to be humble. We don't think too high of ourselves. We're called to be gentle and not harsh or abrasive, to consider others, to grow in our patience, to be molded into the likeness of Jesus. And above all, Jesus said, or Paul says, put on love. Actually, put it on because that's what locks in those other virtues in perfect unity that we would put on love. So you know how to do that. Think about it. When you go out on the night on the town and maybe like your outfit is not complete just yet, 
And you start to look through the closet, and you're like, I'm going to put this jacket on. And you put it on, and you're like, you know, no one's in the room, of course, with you. But you're like, dang, I look pretty good. I look pretty good with this jacket. It just completed it. That is what Jesus is talking about here. When, when they encourage us to put on love, he's saying, put on your best. Put on your best. Your best is Jesus. Your best is all of those qualities that he works in and through you. That is your best. See, God is the overarching uh, garment in your wardrobe for you to wear at all times. And then when we show each other that kind of compassion and that kind of love with gentleness and patience, like who, who doesn't want to be a part of that? Who doesn't want to be a part of that? All of us long for that kind of love and that kind of family. So Paul's like, just put it on before you go out. Put on the best. Verse 15, it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. And so Paul tells us to be people of peace. Sounds amazing, doesn't it? You know, a lot of us, when we think about the thing we need most outside of Jesus is his peace, isn't it? Like there are things happening in you, in and around you, maybe in your family, and you just want God's peace. And gosh, I just locked eyes with someone. And Paul is telling us to be people of peace, to let the peace of God wash over us. So we've been called to live as one people. And so our thoughts, our words, our actions, and they've got to reflect the peace of God. They have to bring peace. See, our attitudes have to be one that are so thankful to God that we would bring that same peace that God has given us, even though we're sinful and messed up, that we would be people who give that peace to others. As Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. So we need to be a community that is saturated by this peace, and we learn about this peace through the scriptures, through one another, through the way that we love one another, through the way that we sing songs. Like, if you could hear yourself singing that last song, that's what it looks like to, to be a part of this community. You're so excited because of what God has done for you, you can't help but explode in joy through hymns and songs and worship with the people of God. It's incredible. Like, that is the peace of God. When you experience peace, you explode because it feels so good. God's saying, would you be the people who bring peace to others? And so spending time in Scripture and in prayer, that is going to be the key to everything. I promise you that's the key to everything. The Spirit of God would work through what you read or what you listen, or maybe you don't like to read, but you listen to the Word of God through prayer, through silence, all of that, God works through that. But our, our, our unity will grow with people according to our proximity with Jesus. So if you're closer to him, you spend time with him, you won't be offended as much. You won't be quick to respond. You'll be quick to be a, a person of peace, to bring that to other people. The common thing that's missing often is practice. Because a lot of times we know what to do, but we don't have the opportunity to practice. Maybe we're not willing. Maybe we're scared or timid. But that's where the goal is right? So when you bring, uh, if you have a child and they play sports, you know that the grind is in practice. And then when you see them do something really good and special and you're so proud, it's because they put the work in already. They put the work in day in and day out. Practice is essential to our life and our formation with Jesus. And the way that we grow is going to be through practice. It will never be through words. It will not be through just mere words. We've got to be a people who practice that. So you deliver peace to people. And that requires consistency you're going to go through uh, hard times. You're going to make mistakes, but that's okay. As we practice this slowly in a world where we want to see growth like this, it's okay. Jesus doesn't work on that time frame. His growth is slow in you and through you, and he does the work that he needs to do. And with time, I can promise you, if you spend time with Jesus, you spend time in prayer, you spend time with God's people, through that practice, good things will flow in you and through you. And everybody else gets to be the, benef the beneficiary to that, which is amazing. So I want to leave you with a few different things, all right? So when, 
we can strengthen our unity when we clothe ourselves in God's love. That's what the whole passage is about. We strengthen our unity as a church. This is for all of us. This is when we clothe ourselves in God's love. For us, we know we are the temple of God. Jesus said before he uh, went to the cross that he would send the spirit of God, which is God himself living in you and living in me. That means we are clothed in God's love. That means you actually, you can embody that to the people around you. And clothing is often an expression of who we are. It often expresses the things we love and who we are as people. And so every day when you decide what you're going to wear, you want to clothe yourself in an outfit that doesn't go out of style. All right, clothes go out of style. You get stuff from the 70s coming back. It's ridiculous. But Jesus, his love does not go out of fashion. It's what people are looking for. It's what you're looking for. It's what everyone else out there in that world is looking for. And so we have to choose to embrace kindness and compassion and gentleness and patience and love. We've got to choose it. It doesn't happen on its own. And so we've got to listen to others. We've got to show care and concern for people. We've got to perform acts of kindness or simply just use a word that builds up another brother or sister. We've got to recognize differences in values that other people bring to the table. That when we, we, we sense that our unity is compromised, we respond with peace. That we go through difficult situations with a gentle spirit. We're not people who stir up conflict. We're people who embody Jesus and want to clothe ourselves with that so we can bring that to other people. And so you've got to start each day with asking God, God, help me. Help me through the power of your spirit. And, and if you're like me, you have probably got to ask multiple times throughout the day. God, I need your help. And dunks, yo, I need your help right now. So I'm waiting in line too long, right? Like we, we need... We need the Spirit's help in that. And God is so kind, he will give you exactly what you need. Think about the difference that you can make in someone's day in this place if you would just be kind and show that kindness to other people. Let it be what you wear. Second thing is that we can strengthen our unity when we forgive one another. When we forgive one another. It sounds easy, right? But the command to forgive as the Lord forgives is startling. That's what it says in the text. How can we forgive like the Lord forgives? Is that what Paul's really asking us? Is that what he's asking us under that statement that we would forgive as God forgives? Forgiveness is a hot topic. It's so close to us, it's sensitive. But forgiveness isn't denying uh, what was done is, is, I'm sorry, forgiveness isn't denying that what was done is, is wrong. It's not contingent on an apology. It's not forgetting and it's not reconciling. Sometimes forgiveness is not reconciling, but it is canceling a debt. Forgiveness is an ongoing process. I can stand up here and tell you that for sure. I've got some wounds in my life that have taken so long to forgive, not even just myself or other people. Forgiveness is an ongoing process. Don't let no one tell you it happens in a moment. It is an ongoing process. Forgiveness is not wanting ill for the person who offended you, right? Forgiveness is removing the control the other person has over you. And forgiveness doesn't diminish the offense, but it stops your heart from being poisoned by it. See, we know that reconciliation often takes two people. Like, you can't reconcile unless you have two people. Forgiveness takes one person. Forgiveness takes one person. It is essential for us as we move forward to be united as people, as the people of God. We will have to practice forgiveness often. I've had to ask forgiveness from some of you. Don't raise your hand. (laughs) You have asked me to forgive you, and that's part of this process. That's what it means. So forgiveness is like a bridge that needs constant maintenance. Sorry, no pun intended, but it happens. If not tended to, that bridge will fall down. It will cause division in your life. And I think that practicing forgiveness is the muscle that helps you know how to receive it for yourself and then extend it to other people. So every day you've got to practice that. It's not just going to happen on its own. You've got to ask for for opportunities for it. And you've got to ask God, give me the strength I need. See, forgiving others as we have been forgiven is only possible through Christ. It's only possible through Christ. And if he lives in you, I think you can extend that too. If he lives in me, I can extend that that kind of forgiveness too. The last thing is that we can strengthen our unity when we let the peace of Christ rule our hearts. That word rule means like an umpire in a game. Calling balls and strikes and fouls, messing it, whatever that is. But 
God is the umpire. He gets to decide what happens. But what he wants you to do is to play in the rules of the game and to let peace rule your hearts, that we would be people who give that to, other, to others around us, that he's not talking about the individual peace in this, in this passage. He's talking about our collective interpersonal peace as brothers and sisters. Do you know that's the peace that was fractured in the garden? So when we sin, our peace with God was fractured and not the same. It also fractured our relationship with each other. And so as we let the peace of heart, the peace of Christ rule our hearts, we actually bring heaven down to earth. As we have harmony in our relationships, we look more like what it was supposed to be like in the garden. And so God asks us to participate in making all things new. That includes letting the peace of God rule your hearts. That's what it looks like. So when we choose to act in love and be at peace, we are following the way of Jesus. We are making the love of Jesus tangible for those around us to see. And so when we face conflicts, we've got to focus on peace and reconciliation. We have to do our part to maintain unity in the body. All of us. All of us sitting in this room. If Bridgepoint's not your church, you're here just visiting, like take that back home. Be a person of peace. Be a person of unity. Those who are watching online, like resolve to make that a part of who you are. Like you're just going to be a peacemaker, a person who brings people together in unity, that we would avoid stirring up strife and gossip and division. And sometimes the secret conversations in the body are the worst. They sow so many different seeds of discord. Jesus suffered and died to unite us to the Father and one another. That's what he did. His death united us with him and with each other. And to disregard unity is to disparage the cross. And so we each have to do our part. We've got to pursue unity, to be peacemakers, to build people up, to build the church up, and not to tear it down. Psalm 133, 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Think about that, that we are, when we are maintaining our unity, we are pleasant to God. We're pleasant to one another. God's looking up, looking down from heaven, be like, those are my people. Those are my people. They're pursuing unity. They're making much of me. People are coming to follow Jesus because of the way they love one another. It's attractive to them. See, unity has always been important to Jesus. When our unity is compromised, what I'm asking you to do is to push in, to show each other the love of Jesus to be willing to overlook offense. It doesn't mean you don't have a conversation, but everyone needs to pursue that as their personal mandate. What we steward here in the church is the most important news in the, on the globe about Jesus and his forgiveness and his reconciliation. That is what we're stewarding. It is incredibly valuable. And so I'm asking you, no matter who you are, would you pursue unity? Would you choose that? Would you choose love? For those of you who have never made a decision, I've got a decision to follow Jesus. I've got the best news for you. Even though you and I have sinned and moved away from God, Jesus made a way for you to come home. Amen. Jesus wants to clothe you with his love and his compassion so that you don't need to be pushed down by your guilt and your shame. So no matter who you are or what you've done or what's been done to you, we say it all the time, Jesus is for you. Jesus is for you. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus allows you to come home. In fact, some of the scriptures talk about a God who is waiting off in the distance, waiting for you to come. He's waiting for you to receive the love that he has to offer you. We know peace with God is not automatic because we run from him for our own choices and our own sin. But how good is God that he lets you come back home? How good that he would lay his life on the, on the line to give his life up for you. That he would die on a cross, he would be raised to life, and he offers you the same thing if you would just say yes to him. Right. Often, when I sat in churches for a long time, week after week, that would come up in the message of like, I already know what he's doing. I already know where he's going. I'm not interested in it. I'd go home willing that I made, uh, wishing that I actually made that decision because I needed it. That's the thing you need most. If you are far from God, what you need is peace with God. And that comes through your belief. It's already been done. Jesus did it for you already. Your response is to say yes to the Savior. Let him be your Lord. Let him be your King. You ask for forgiveness and you walk away from your old life. It's a fancy word called repentance. You just walk away from the past. It's trash anyway. You don't want to do that. 
Walk through the newness of life that God has given you. See, often we think our mistakes are too, are too much. God can't overlook them. They're not. If you look at the life of Jesus, he attached himself to sinners. Not because he was sinful. Because that was the only way that they would know how much he loved them. And so if you have not made a decision, raise, not raise your hand right now. Raise the white flag. Seriously. Raise the white flag. That is a deal that you've got to take. And so after this service, we, we invite people to come forward to tell people that you want Jesus. You're desperate for him. We've seen people come in off the streets. We've seen people run up after service. Come and tell someone. Not because of the special prayer that we're going to lead you through. It's because we want to help you. We want to help you know who Jesus is. We want to walk with you because that's what you need most. And then you get to be a part of making this church complete and beautiful, moving toward unity for the sake of Jesus and for one another. And so if you want to make that decision, come forward after. Talk to one of the prayer partners up here and they would love to pray with you. For all of us, our simple step is to be people of peace. Walk toward unity. May the love of Jesus be found in this place. May we steward that love, show it to the world around us so that we can make much of Jesus. Let's pray. God, I love you so much. Oh, you're so good. You're so worthy. And God, we just love you because of who you are. We love you because you are holy. And at the same time, you invite us close to you to be in relationship with you. God, I pray that we each would resolve right now in this place to be people of unity. I pray that we bring your goodness, your kindness, your compassion, and your peace to those around us. God, make us more beautiful as a church. I pray that as we interact with one another, we know things are going to go, uh, things are going to be hard and difficult sometimes. But God, you give us your spirit to pursue unity. I pray that we would be more like you. God, draw more people to this home, to this church family, because of the way we love one another, so that they could give their life to you and be changed forever. Amen.